accurate time in the busy cities easy in this digitised 21st century, with the likes of cell phones and computers making it easy for us to attend those important appointments and to know when to knock off work. But in an earlier era, those of our forefathers who couldn't afford the luxury of a personal timepiece were reliant on public clocks. That's why a municipal clock was central to the design of these grand old wooden government buildings. The construction of the building in 1876 marked an important turning point in New Zealand's political history. The change from six provincial governments working in different locations around the country to one central government located in Wellington. The cabinet ministers and public servants needed to know the correct time in order to keep the mechanism of government ticking along smoothly. But this prominently positioned clock also served the general public as they went about their business in downtown Wellington. The old clock still ticks on, night and day, telling the time to Wellingtonians. At over 130 years of age, it's one of the oldest functioning municipal clocks in New Zealand. The clock was lovingly restored by skilled tradesmen during a two-year overhaul of government buildings in the mid-1990s and has been working pretty well since. Time stood still for a short time in 2007, but local clock restorer Doug Tucker soon got it ticking again. Today, the Department of Conservation continues to care for old government buildings for the benefit and the enjoyment of all New Zealanders. Visitors to the building can view historical interpretation displays on the ground floor and head up to the first floor into the cabinet room. The rest of the building is leased by Victoria University Law School. OK, we'll head up to the attic to get a closer look at the clock. The clock needs to be wound once a week. That's my job, so I'll show you how it's done. This is a flatbed turret clock, popular in the 1850s. Now to think about the clock, it's easiest to separate it into two parts. There's the striking or chiming train, now that's this cog here, which causes the clock to chime the hour. You can see the wire cable which goes up to the belfry. Then you've got the going train, now this is a smaller cog just behind the large one, and this is what drives the hands of the clock. Now, before I wind the clock, I have to first set a mechanism in place. So we've got this uh, mechanism down here with a weight, and I push this into the cog, and that's really important because it allows me to wind the clock while the clock is still going. So the clock's still ticking away, and I can then uh, put the handle on and wind. Now this is the easiest of the two parts of the clock to wind, because it has a much lighter weight. So after winding the clock, which is the smaller of the cogs, I then have to wind this big large one here, which is the striking chain, which makes the bell chime. Now this is a way tougher job, as the weight for the hourly chime is heavier than the one for the clock. The weight of the chime and the weight of the clock hang down a shaft of four storeys all the way down to the basement. Now these two weights combined weigh a massive 140 kilograms. As the clock unwinds, so do the weights. They unwind all the way down to the basement. I check the time and listen to the clock, and this is all I have to do once a week to ensure the clock keeps going. The pendulum is timed and geared to lift and lower two claws fitted to the escape wheel. As the forward claw lifts, it allows the wheel to turn one cog, then the rear cog stops it. The regular stop-start movement creates the tick-tock sound. If the clock is running a little slow, or too fast, I can adjust the minute dial. To reset the hourly chime, like for daylight savings, I adjust the wheel here. Only a few years ago, the name of the clock's makers, Gillette and Bland of Croydon, London, was discovered on the back of the brass minute dial. Before this discovery, it was thought that the name here, GL Genus of Wellington, was the maker. Now, Genis was in fact a clockmaker based in Willis Street, who imported the clock from London in 1876. 
it is thought that members of the genus family kept the government building's clock wound on time for years after it was installed in the attic of government buildings. The clock has cast iron hands and figures originally set on an opaque glass front designed to be illuminated at night. The illumination was initially lit by a gas lamp. Earlier this century, this clock was electrically linked to the Meteorological Office at the Dominion Observatory to ensure the accuracy of the timepiece was strictly monitored. Today the time is set according to the hourly time pips on Radio New Zealand. Past restoration work revealed an electric winding mechanism. Now the Department of Conservation has chosen to manually wind the clock week by week to ensure that the use of the clock is as close to original as possible. There are not many of these clocks still hand wound, so while we might not be right on the money when it comes to the time, we do our best to ensure that the commuters rushing to the nearby railway station get to their trains on time. And in today's fast-paced world, people can always check their watches or cell phones.